Alaska is in a class of its own. Affectionately known as the last frontier, this massive state contains vastly more wilderness than it does civilization. Whether on land or via the ocean, Alaska is brimming with dozens of species of impressive wildlife. Large animals like moose, black bear, brown bear, and caribou outnumber the meager human population, which is just over 736,000. In fact, there are an estimated 750,000 caribou in Alaska alone. Given the rugged nature of the state and its seemingly abundant natural resources, it should come as no surprise that Alaska has more than its fair share of Sasquatch stories and strange encounters with hairy man-like creatures. In May of 2022, the small town monsters crew headed out on a wild Alaskan journey that would take us across various parts of the state. Seth and part of the crew spent time interviewing eyewitnesses and compiling strange stories from the Kenai Peninsula and up to the interior near Denali National Park and everywhere in between. Initially, Eli and I spent a week in a remote area of the Kenai Peninsula with a history of possible Sasquatch activity, which will be covered in a future Beyond the Trail episode. However, we also explored interior Alaska, journeying far and wide in search of those stories that would inevitably leave us with more questions than answers. Join us on part of our epic Alaskan adventure in search of Alaska's Sasquatch. One of the first places we visited was the Bigfoot Art Gallery in Palmer, Alaska, run by artist and Sasquatch enthusiast Rob Roy Menzies. So when I bought it, it was originally called Mad Manners, uh, 40 years of people coming in here. So I already had customers, that wasn't a problem. I felt the business name was important and just because of who I am and what I did, I felt changing it to Bigfoot would be a fun, fun little thing to do. It's, it's mainly art, um, uh, mostly my art, but there's a lot of local other artists that are in here. People see Bigfoot Art Gallery, they, got, they want to see Bigfoot when they come in. Of course, it's Big George, I've got some other things to, to satisfy that curiosity that people come in. And they want to see it, this is what they want to see. So, it, you know, starting the business off, matting and framing, and, and maybe a little Bigfoot turned into, wow, there's a lot of Bigfoot. Rob Roy has been involved in creating Bigfoot art for quite a while. 
I've always been interested in Bigfoot, always been interested in the monsters and things like that. I, I kind of got my reinterested in it when the internet came out in the 90s. Came the curiosity of one day sitting there in my studio at night and I typed in Bigfoot on the search engine and boom, up came a bunch of Bigfoot sites and we're talking nine, you know, mid 90s. So immediately noticed a lot of crappy drawings and blurry pictures and just no legitimacy to to any of the stories really. And I, I, I delve into these stories and I became almost just obsessed with what they look like. I, I just like, wow. And, I, and, and through the years, even before this, I've always been interested in people's Bigfoot stories. I've been told, I've heard stories all my life, really, growing up here in Alaska. So with my Bigfoot art, I love to combine, you know, the photo photography one, but I get to go exploring. Um, once, once I kind of got the idea of what they kind of look like, and I, I, I'm not saying I'm drawing what they look like, I expect to be a little wrong, but the nose and certain details and things, I started just kind of throwing Bigfoots in scenes. And so what a better place to find scenes is driving around on your four-wheeler or, you know, I go to places that are pretty isolated and are beautiful. So it's, it's in one way it's sharing what I'm, what I'm living in and another way, it's just a fun way for me to keep contributing but yet keeping it um, legitimate and kind of giving it a look that adds a little more wildlife-ish look to it versus, you know, horror movie scene. Whenever we've visited Bigfoot-themed museums or stores across North America, I've noticed those institutions become a place for locals and visitors alike to share their encounter stories with less fear of ridicule. The Bigfoot Art Gallery is no different in this regard, as Rob Roy would explain to us. It's a, it's a great benefit of the name is bringing co people coming in and they immediately open up um, about their encounter or someone else's encounter or, you know, somebody in their family had some kind of encounter. What amazes me is how many are local and have had local experiences, um, which is what I was kind of hoping for is kind of really because I'm curious. I've had a lot of natives come in from up north. Uh, and tell me stories um, that kind of, you know, I've heard these before, but it's fun to hear them from people that have never told them. The whole subject has gotten a little more open, but there are still a lot of people who just will not flat out don't believe. But I want to say more so you'll run into either open-minded people or people that think, yeah, I think it's possible. And I think that is, is becoming kind of a norm almost. But it, it's just like anywhere else you're at, if somebody doesn't believe in Bigfoot, they'll let you know right off the bat. So, But around here, people seem to be pretty open-minded. I'm, I'm shocked, actually. Some of the harshest, you know, um, cu customers that come in here are serious. And, and I'll say, you know, you got any Bigfoot story? For? And they'll, they'll just open up. And it's like, wow, hmm, okay. There's a few key areas I've heard a lot of sightings from. One nearby area with a history of potential Sasquatch activity that Rob Roy told us about is Hatcher Pass. Hatcher Pass is a mountain pass cutting through the southern part of the Talkeetna Mountains. With that, we departed for the Hatcher Pass area via the small town of Willow. All right, ladies and gents, Alex wants to start this movie avant-garde style, so here it is. <laughs> Where are we at right now? I don't know, I don't know. I left my sanity somewhere. Look at that sunset. All right, we're on our way to Willow. Wait, we're in Willow. We stopped at a gas station. Can you see? And uh, yeah, I'm just getting this shot of the old Willow Jail. Take a look at that. Hello. Oh. Help me, I'm trapped. Help me. I don't belong in here. Yeah, so that's a pretty neat little uh, doodad there.
Well, it's 11.52 p.m. right now, as you can see. In Alaska time, that's obviously a lot, <laughs> a lot lighter than most other places. So we're just kind of settling in here with the camper. It's getting nice and warm for the night. Kind of glamping, not what we're used to doing, but when we can, we might as well. Uh, we're gonna explore this area in the morning. We're all pretty tired from some traveling today, so we're gonna do that. Fly the drone up, maybe do a little hike around here. It's still pretty cold in winter up here. I don't know, you know, if anything's living up here, what it would be like. Moose and bear down even in the valley from here. It's just completely green, or it's getting green. So compared to here, where it's pretty much still winter, it's pretty wild up here. The next day, we met up with Rob Roy, who would show us around the area. So Rob Roy, I'm just kind of, you're telling me all these stories, so what is, what is, what is it with this place? There's a long history of sightings in this area? Yeah, there is. I mean, I have always thought that this area in Willow, especially the backside, the, the, the Willow Fishhook Road here, um, I've always heard stories. I mean, going back a couple decades, I've heard um, eyewitnesses, I, I know two of them that saw uh, suppose Sasquatch is out here. I know a couple other guys that had experiences. Um, there's a cast uh, that we can hopefully track down that was cast up here in a general store in the town of Willow. But I mean, it's it's I'm I'm almost shocked that there's more people than me that know all about it. Uh, I just stopped and had coffee, and I talked to the coffee girl, and she knew all about it. I kind of asked her if she's ever heard of Big. Oh yeah, she says Bigfoot. I blah blah. She just kind of opened up about it. Um, but I've known, I want to say, five people alone in the past two decades that have told me stories about up here. Um, so I remember even like a decade ago thinking, huh, that must be a hot spot, you know. And that's the, o the only time I've ever said hot spot. But uh, um, I believe that uh, something is going on here because there's a lot of people that have seen them up here. So um, oh, interesting. I'm always interested to come up here and it's a beautiful place to camp anyway. Um, but uh, I don't know, makes you wonder. So we're gonna take the side by side now and you're gonna kind of show yeah. us some stuff up here. Uh, oh, I'm gonna show you the uh, Trapper's Cabin, which I, I wanna say it dates, it's early 1900s or it could be eight, late 1800s. It's an old, old Trapper's Cabin. Um, it, it, you know, there's no real Bigfoot stories about it at all, but it's just really neat to see, um, in its natural habitat, um, right. before people have picked it apart completely.
that was quite an adventure. Isn't that fun? Usually, uh, oh, usually we can make it. You know, it's uh, this is the main road right here. <laughs> Hopefully, we can just stay on top of it. Yeah. Wow, it is deep in here still. What you doing, boy? Huh? Having life. fun in the water? Oh. Come on, Bucky boy. Nice with the sun beaming off of the, uh, oh, yeah. the uh, snow here. Is it? You go for it. I will. Well, it's definitely old in here. Well, here's an old abandoned cabin. So how old is this thing? I want to say it's late 1800s. Late 1800s, huh? 1900s. Wow. I only know that because when I first found about 10, 12 years ago, there used to be newspaper clippings from the from from the time of when this cabin was built, but they were they were from the the late 1800s. They were like a dishwasher, you know, for sale. You know, in the old script. Wow. And they had pages and pages of these old newspapers stapled to the and nailed to the wall i guess for entertainment but it was incredible to see the, the what was for sale brand new back then it was like the lady scrubbing the the washboard no kidding and it would say new no, from sears you know it, it was old somewhere like 1901 you know so it it was old it, it's back there i would i would want to say early 1900s at, at, at the most yeah um i mean you can tell it's just old Got what looks like moose tracks, something going up that way, up the mountain. Can't really tell what it is from here. Be a haul to get up there. <laughs> oh, a bit. oh, there it goes! <laughs> I think you sank in too much. <laughs> this is Alaska. It's <laughs> all this weird. What we gotta do everywhere we go. So we're at the bus, so Rob Roy. Yes, sir. You were saying that this area has kind of, this whole valley, Hatcher Pass here, has an interesting name, right? Yeah, and I wish I knew what it was. I, I mean, I would butcher it if I tried. Um, but the first time I came up here, met the gentleman that was caretaking this area up here. Uh, and this whole valley is apparently owned by the Athabascans. And there's a word that they're saying, I, I, I've never written it down, I've never seen it written out, so it's hard for me to remember. But um, there's a couple gentlemen that I know of that can tell you what it is, but it basically means Valley of the Wild Man. And supposedly I heard that is why the Athabascans have not built anything back here, any kind of, you know, structures, any right. kind of tourist shops or anything like that. Anyway, it's an interesting, it's an interesting introduction to the to this valley because there are so many sightings up here and there's so many people that seem to be they seem to light up the the coffee girl for one I, I wasn't expecting her to you know oh yeah yeah you know there's bigfoot oh yeah blah 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 so um this this is a hot spot i think i mean just from word of mouth what i've heard so uh 
it's very interesting. Plus, you got it a is. cool bus to look at. This story came to me probably at least 12, 13 years ago, at least, told to me by uh, the gentleman who spoke to the two gold miners. This again was up in the Willow, Willow, Willow Creek area. Lots of gold claims up there. Lots of small time. I mean, you'll see the signs when you go up there, gold claims, do not, do not enter private property. And then uh, he knew these two gentlemen who had been gold mining out there for years. And after, after he spoke to them, um, about his incident, they opened up about their incident. I think the story was they were hiking a while and they stopped and they were eating lunch. They were still for about 20 minutes and they heard some wrestling, rustling around and they didn't have to move too far to see. And what they basically said is they watched two Sasquatch sitting, uh, just kind of sitting there like a bear would in, this, in these bushes, basically taking the leaves and pulling them out you know, of their mouth like a great ape would. It wasn't a lot of details like this available. You know, it wasn't, it, it just seemed really odd for someone to make that up. But again, that, that intrigued me. And, and the gentleman who told me the story had a sighting out there as well. So um, it's like one guy has a sighting, he knows two other guys that had a sighting. It's kind of almost like they band together. You know, they don't want to be ridiculed. So they're safe talking to each other about it. But uh, I mean, it always makes me wonder how they eat, if they do, you know, if they do that, with, like with trees, if they peel them off or, you know, it's just another little piece of the puzzle, I think. Due to the high snow levels, we couldn't do as much off-roading with the side-by-side -side as we would have liked. So we headed back down into the valley to visit some other locations Rob Roy was familiar with. I stopped here because this is this is a plot of land. I, I met a gentleman um, up here years and years ago who had a lot of activity. And what had happened, you can you can't quite see it. We'll get, we'll, we'll look at it around the corner. But there's a there's a big um, more or less a hotel, and it was the idea of three gentlemen that to start a hotel here and kind of an Alaska land and rent four wheelers. They'd rent do this anyway. Uh, they pulled out. It failed. The bank ended up owning the property. So my friend got the job as being caretaker for this property. Now there's 20 acres here. It's, it's out here in the middle of nothing. There's a gate about a thousand feet up that will close in the winter time so people can't drive through here. Um, but this gentleman would hear wood knocks almost every night coming from this area right here. Right here? Right here. And I can tell you that because there's that old dilapidated, that what used to be a tree fort. And I found it interesting when, when he was telling us up at the house up there, we walked down into this area and that's the first thing I saw. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting because there's this old dilapidated, it's a, it used to be a tree house, but there's old pieces of wood laying around, plenty of things for them, I guess, to grab and smack. But it was just kind of interesting that there was something there and that's where the noises are coming from. Um, and you can see the road here. You can hear, I mean, when you're up there, you can hear cars driving by here and it's a very secluded place, especially you know towards the winter months. Nobody comes up here. Um, so again, it's a, it's another strange, um, strange thing that's happened up here. About another, we'll say maybe 2,000 feet up here. Um, Dan, my friend that used to live here, found about a 17-inch track as well up there. One of my favorite stories that uh, that Dan told me while he was caretaking the facility was in the middle of winter. His kids had just got on that bus about two hours prior, went to school. There's nobody up here. The gate's locked. You can't even drive through here. Um, he had no running water. He has n no power. He had generators only. And so for entertainment, he would often sit in his, in his truck, in his Ford Bronco, and with his laptop and watch movies. So one day he was, he was sitting out in his Bronco watching a movie on his laptop, and nobody around sunny day it just snowed it was a beautiful sunny day but lots of snow around and all of a sudden a snowball hits his windshield like he's he explained that if his windshield wasn't there the snowball would have hit him right in the head and it was a big snowball too it wasn't like a little tiny kid snowball or something but it hit the windshield it scared him to the point where he threw the laptop because it had been quiet for hours 
he kind of went, you know, swore, ah, darn it. And he, he gets out. He thought it was one of his friends, one of his few friends that live up here. He got out of, of, of his truck and he starts yelling, nothing. Nobody, nobody around. Nobody said anything. He quickly kind of walked around down here. He looked. There was nobody, nobody around. No tracks, no trucks, no, no, didn't hear any vehicles. Um, so that was a head scratcher for him. And he still to this day does not know what or who threw that snowball. But it, it, uh, with all the other Sasquatch stories up here, it really makes you wonder. I mean, they throw rocks? Is it possible? Could they throw a snowball? I don't know, but um, it's one of my favorite stories from up here. Wow. We were lucky the restaurant into a shop. Okay, uh, so we just stopped by this local cafe that Rob Roy actually had heard from one of the people working here that they had talked about different stories in the area. What's going yeah, on? you know, and I've always wanted to stop. I've stopped here many times. I'm, not, I'm never really asked. Um, but I asked the, the, the gal working and uh, if she's ever heard of any Bigfoot stories up, up here, which I have. And much to my surprise, she opened right up and said, oh yeah, oh yeah, all the time and blah, blah, blah. And it kind of surprised me, um, which is nice to hear because it verifies that what I've heard for the last few decades, that, that this willow seems to be a spot that they're seeing um, a lot at. So. Um, yeah, she was talking about people down um, the creek here. What is the name yeah, of it? Uh, oh, Trapper Creek. Yeah, Trapper Creek is Trapper another creek, hot spot. Having here been, in uh, Woodnox, people talking about a tall, hairy brown thing in the trees and that kind of thing. So it's just cool to yeah, hear that you cool. know an area that has that you know of stories independently of these people, yes. and you're hearing stories, and right? And then this gal here finally explained to me where there's a cast. There's an actual plaster cast that was that was cast right out here. I've heard about it for since I've lived here, and I, I, I've never been able to find the store. Now I can find it, so I'm really eager to look at it. Yeah, I think it's right going to be neat. So very cool. Yeah. All right, so we just got done hanging out with Rob Roy. He was showing us around the area a little bit. We're going to head up into a little bit further up into the pass and kind of check it out, and uh, just drive around there for a little bit. Come back down here, find a spot for the night. Beautiful morning here. We've got this awesome wooded backdrop behind us. What do you think, Eli? I think it's incredible. I heard we had a little intruder last night in the uh, in the camper. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was on the phone, you see, till 2:30 in the morning, and then I slipped and I fell opening the door, so it kind of flung open and made a really loud noise. And in comes this silhouetted figure, me carrying nothing but a gun and I hear Alex go hey 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 who is that <laughs> launching that drone squatchy. up squatchy for sure so what do you think of this area I think it's pretty incredible I mean being up at the pass yesterday was like the mountains were really unique with the swoops yeah yeah, this is, seems like a very squatchy valley here. You got the mountain up that way. Well, the flat kind of mountain, just a lot of woods. Saw those moose going up the mountain yesterday. Oh yeah. So there could be all kinds of critters around here. The next morning as we headed out, we stopped by the town of Willow once again to try and track down the footprint casting that Rob Roy had mentioned. So, well, we were just at this shop in uh, Willow here. People kept telling us to go check it out. They had some kind of a track there. 
and we got to see this track and unfortunately we couldn't get any pictures or video of it. The person there was already a little bit kind of hesitant to talk about it but told us a bunch of interesting Bigfoot stories from the area and showed us this track which was really interesting. I mean it's one of the best tracks I've ever seen. It's very clear, yeah. I wish we could have gotten a picture of it but what we're gonna do now is we're both gonna sketch it to our best ability and just kind of with that mental memory try and capture it right away so let's just draw it real quick. We both got our drawings. Eli, you want to show us your drawing? How to sign it and make sure this is what I saw. Okay. As best so I could see. That's what you got. Yep. Here's what I got. Compare them. Pretty similar. Yeah. Toes seemed like they were disconnected. I remember that, that front toe being very, it was very far out. Yeah. It was, and it was like almost like there was a slide on there or something. Mm -hmm. It was a really great track though. Man, I wish we could have gotten a picture, but yeah, that's as close as we're gonna get, folks. Yep. So, aside from the track, we were told some stories. Um, this person used to collect kind of stories at their shop there and um, told us some pretty interesting ones. The craziest one, the wow factor, I guess, was a story that this person told us was uh, told by an old timer said they were up in the Talkeetna Mountains and there's a story that for multiple people have talked about of a some sort of military base with these doors in a mountain that open. I mean that's the story that uh, this old timer came in and was talking about snowmobiling many years ago in this mountain range stopped going over a hill to roll a cigarette and noticed these Bigfoot creatures chained up with the military dragging moose carcasses into this mountain base type thing and the guy said he didn't really care because he apparently had lost friends and his wife over this story but he's like I know what I saw that's what uh, this person told us conveyed so we're, we're hearing this is a story we're hearing from somebody told by somebody else so obviously there is a kind of a degree of separation but that was a really interesting story yeah that was wild that was one of those really weird ones so I don't know obviously we don't know any the veracity or any of the kind of uh you know details about this but that's that's basically what we got so right with that being said yeah time to hit the road following hatcher pass we departed for further north into interior alaska we would be driving the entirety of the famous denali highway a 135 mile stretch of mostly unpaved road So it begins, huh? Yes, we're going on the infamous Denali Highway here. It's, uh, it used to be the only highway that went through this area, apparently, between Paxson, which is literally nothing here, to the Cantwell slash Denali area, so. Stop for a little dinner break. It's heating up some water. Not a bad view, not a bad spot. Let's see, dinner break at 11.25. We eventually arrived in the town of Healy, Alaska, just outside of Denali National Park. So we spent all day yesterday traveling the Denali Highway, driving through. It was absolutely beautiful, but today we are up towards 
Denali National Park. We're here, uh, we met up with the rest of the Small Town Monsters crew. We're gonna be spending the next few days here, checking out the National Park. Should be pretty cool. There's a lot of activity and history from this area in terms of Bigfoot sightings. So I'm really excited to see what the Denali area has to offer, differing from Hatcher Pass and where we were earlier. Denali National Park itself encompasses an area of over 6 million protected acres. It is as remote as it gets, with minimal human impact compared to most national parks. Located within the national park itself is Mount Denali, formerly known as Mount McKinley. This mountain is the largest peak in North America, at 20,310 feet. Denali is usually covered by clouds for most of the year, with only an estimated 30 to 40 percent of visitors to the area ever able to see the peak. While we were there, we got quite lucky with multiple chances to view it unobstructed. Alaska has quite the reputation of making people disappear. With so many threats from weather, wildlife, and the remoteness alone, the Great Alaskan Wilderness has claimed countless lives over the years. One of the most well-known missing person stories in Alaska, and perhaps in the world, was that of the tragic story of 24-year-old Christopher McCandless. In the early 1990s, McCandless hitchhiked across the United States, eventually ending up in Alaska, heading out from the town of Healy into the unforgiving wilderness, attempting to live off the land for good. He was last seen in April of 1992. McCandless made his home in an abandoned bus 28 miles down the Stampede Trail in a section of Denali National Park. Foraging and hunting off of the land as best he could, McCandless attempted to return to civilization in July, but was unable to due to the impassable and dangerously flowing Teklanika River. Essentially being stuck in the area, McCandless grew weaker and as time went on, eventually would succumb to starvation. With various theories about his death, including possible poisoning due to toxic plants he may have consumed, his body was discovered in the bus by hunters in early September of 1992. The McCandless story has become immortalized in the minds of millions around the world through a best-selling book called Into the Wild and a popular movie of the same title from 2007. His story was one of a young man attempting to shun the modern world and live in some sort of harmony with nature. McCandless was by all measures ill-prepared for this vast undertaking, and while his story has inspired many, it should serve as a stark warning that nature has no mercy. the bus. So this is a replica of the magic bus. I guess this is the one that was used in the movie Into the Wild. This is the actual movie prop bus we uh, saw here in town in Healy. Just thought it'd be really cool to stop by obviously since part of the lore here with the Chris McCandless story. The inside of the bus has a pretty cool replica of all of the stuff he would have had in there. Well some of it Got all these information panels on here too, but you got the wood stove and the bed in there. Kind of a cool thing to see. Pretty similar to the actual, actual bus. It's here at a local brewery. You can see on this side, kind of the actual bus. 142 is the number of the bus, and then you've got the chair or a replica of the chair you would have sat at. One of our first goals in the Denali National Park area was to explore this area and the vastness it had to offer via helicopter. So we're actually about to go do a helicopter tour here, uh, taking us kind of near the Denali area. We're going to land in an area, give us a kind of good overhead view of the whole area. should be really exciting. We're going to be flying with the doors open, which is always fun. 
done that for another flight when we were in the Adirondacks. So I'm pretty excited. Should be awesome. It's a beautiful day. Should be able to see Denali slash Mount McKinley pretty well. So you guys excited? Very. Seth, excited? Oh yeah, pumped. Eli, we're, we're I'm ready. Doing it. This is gonna be fun. I'm DJI is ready. You think it's flighty like first dude. helicopter flight, right? It's fun. You enjoy it? Oh yeah. Doors wide open. That mountain right there, that's Denali. You can see it right in the background there. Denali right over there, whole peak. Pretty far from us here, but uh, as you can see, a lot of tree cover down in those valleys, and up here we're kind of in the alpine zone, so you get sheep and other animals in this environment. As I sat by and looked on down into the endless snowy forest before me, I couldn't help but imagine what a tough existence something like a Sasquatch would have in an area like this. While food sources ostensibly seem plentiful in terms of game, like moose and caribou, the extremes and weather cannot be understated. An analogy I found interesting was about the differences between brown bears and grizzly bears. While both are part of the same species, brown bears live closer to coastal areas and as a result their diets include marine life as well as terrestrial wildlife, thus overall being richer and resulting in larger animals. Grizzly bears on the other hand live in inland areas and are slightly smaller, having to fight a bit harder for their meals. With Sasquatch reports being present in both coastal and inland areas of Alaska, I wondered if perhaps there wasn't a similar occurrence with Sasquatch. Hypothetically, a Sasquatch living in a coastal temperate rainforest, like those found on Alaska's Kenai Peninsula, wouldn't have to move around much to have access to a wide variety of food sources from both land and sea, plus the weather would be far more mild year-round, as opposed to areas of interior Alaska.
That evening, we went out to an area recommended to us by a local Sasquatch researcher we had been in contact with. All right, well, we're out here. We've got Andy, STM crew member out here in the field with us. So it looks like it's pretty light out, right? Well, this is Alaska. It is about 1035 almost right now. Pretty wild, right? It's what crazy. do you think about being out here? I mean, you've been in Alaska now doing the other shoot, but yeah. what do you think? Um, it's crazy to actually be out here and be remote like this. Um, should just see the vastness of everything. It, um, we're not even in anywhere extreme and just the pure like size of what we're around, the like mountains that rise up around us, it's crazy to see. Oh, like, totally. It's, it's not like anywhere else I've ever been that's just this big, this mountainous, you know, anything could be out here. Oh, for sure. So we're now on the Stampede Trail Road. This road essentially comes to an end up there and this is somewhere around the area where Chris McCandless was dropped off from which point he went out however many miles he went up to the spot where he unfortunately passed away where that that bus used to be so this that story you know resonates with a lot of people i read that book when i was younger a lot of people know of into the wild and whether it be the book or the movie the whole chris mccandless story is really interesting but in talking to locals in this area including a local researcher we've had some very interesting stuff come up about some kind of a strange vandalism that occurred so Chris McCandless passed away in 1992. We were actually told about an official report that was filed with the United States Department of the Interior, that's the National Park Service, in 1992. And the way it was described to me is that there were these uh, cabins that were seven miles as the crow flies from where Chris McCandless's bus was. And the cabins were v found vandalized. And they were, basically what they were were three small remote cabins that were used to store food for um, dog sled teams on the way. They would just stop there. So nobody lived there. This was very out of the way, but they were discovered completely vandalized and destroyed and sort of alluded that they were blamed on Chris McCandless. So I'm gonna actually read directly from the report here. I have the document. Somebody was able to get it through um, like a Freedom of Information Act. So it says, uh, this is the Denali National Park and Preserve. Uh, nature of incident vandalism of government property and it looks like it's filed on the 4th of August 1992 I found the Sushasna patrol cabin along with two privately owned cabins nearby seriously vandalized details of incident I hiked north from the Denali Road Park access in the outer range down the Susana River drainage. At 1615 hours, I arrived at the patrol cabin on the park's north boundary. The cabin had obviously been thoroughly ransacked. Miscellaneous debris littered the ground around the cabin. Spiked shutters were torn off. Windows were shattered. The door was ripped from its hinges, dangling askew. A portion of the corrugated metal roof was bent up. The wood stove chimney was detached from the roofing and the pit toilet structure was a contorted wreck. Much of the cabin's contents, including two mattresses, a Coleman stove, a metal garbage can, and pots and pans had been pulled outside. The interior of the cabin was in shambles of broken glass, spilled nails, overturned tables, and stools. A porcupine was busy chewing on pieces of splintered wood inside. Obviously wasn't the porcupine though. I continued hiking downstream beyond the park boundary for approximately one mile to an unfinished log cabin owned by, we won't say the person's name, this cabin had been vandalized as well, miscellaneous items including fiberglass insulation, ski boots, nails, and a crumpled garbage can had apparently been removed from the cabin and hurled outside. A canvas wall tent near the cabin was partially collapsed. Yet another cabin suffered a similar fate. I discovered this cabin just located downstream from the two that I had just mentioned was thoroughly gutted. Cook stoves, mattresses, kilts, carpeting, and even the heavy metal wood stove had been pulled outside. Ceiling boards were torn and fiberglass insulation hung up in shreds from the ceiling. The spiked shutters had been removed from the door and windows and the windows were smashed. The cabin like the other two was a giant mess. It was obvious that all the damage to all three cabins had been done many weeks previously. Mattresses and carpet lying outside were all wet and mildewed and vegetation had grown up around the debris lying outside the cabins. It was equally obvious to me that the vandalism was entirely the work of humans and not bears. 
The damage was too uniform and too complete to have been done by bears. A heavy metal wood stove carried outside, every mattress pulled outside, every window smashed, and the signature claw marks of bears were nowhere to be found. Because I was alone on my days off and without a camera to document the damage, I did not disturb or move anything. I reported the vandalism to the, the district ranger upon my return to park headquarters on 5th of August, 1992. So that's the full report that was filed. And I mean, I have the document right here. I, I can pull up a image of it on screen. But so the person we spoke to, this local researcher kind of alluded to that possibly being Sasquatch related. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's entirely possible that that was the work of humans. No doubt about it. Um, but it, cle it seems clear that it wasn't wildlife. It wasn't bears, certainly wasn't moose, wasn't caribou, wasn't a porcupine that was found inside. Obviously, it was just being there opportunistically. It was clearly something with opposable thumbs. So I don't want to allude that that could be Sasquatch at all, but that's what this person was kind of inferring. They said that, uh, you know, one of the details not in the, in the report was that the metal roofing seven feet high was kind of twisted upwards. So, um, but it was sort of alluded that it was Chris McCandless that did this, which I think is sort of unfortunate because, uh, you know, this guy, he wasn't particularly large and especially at the time he would have been starving. Um, you know, why somebody in that condition that was essentially dying would hike seven miles to some cabins with food in them and not take the food, but vandalize everything and destroy it all and leave it kind of askew. I think it's unfortunate that he was sort of alluded that it was that it was him, but it could have been other people. That's that's possible. Um, it's just uh, really interesting because it ties into that story, and it's right around the same time Chris was out there. Now I don't know if there's been other vandalism like that in years past or or since then. Um, I don't know, but that was interesting. I wanted to share, especially since we're here, not far from you know the end of the Stampede Trail. It's like it's it's really interesting detail. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know what. Again, that's that's literally. It makes no sense for it to be him, with yeah, the fact that exactly. food isn't taken. I know, I yeah. know. It's it's just like it was purposefully done mm -hmm. to just destroy this place. And it and it really seems to be something that was like done with superhuman strength, or like beyond human strength, it, it especially that of people. a starving person. Yeah. Well, yeah, it had to have been. If it is people, which again I think is entirely possible, it had to have been a group of people because they they moved that big woods. I mean, I don't know how yeah. big the wood stove is, but. I don't know if you've ever he mentioned, felt a wood th stove. This researcher mentioned hundreds of pounds. This yeah, thing this thing would have been, you know, you'd have multiple people out there. So it's either something really strong, but Chris McCandless, no. Not not, not at least what I think. So, yeah, I think it'd be cool to launch the drone up. Maybe that'll show us where things have been moving. I don't know how much we're going to be able to move with this much snow cover here. But we shall see. Any out of place oddities. Whoa, I did find some tracks. Oh yeah? Look. Oh yeah, get closer to those. I wonder what those are. Get it real close, can you see? Or there could be a lot of snow melt going on here. Weird. Huh. I mean, could be anything from moose to a bear. Just follow it until you find the animal. Yeah. Oh, Imagine. well, it keeps going. It's hugging the trees. Oh, but it keeps going. Whoa. Excuse me, sir, could you keep it down? We're trying to look for Bigfoot here. Don't you know I have to sneak up on these animals? Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure our, tr our vehicle doesn't fall apart. Where are we in relation to us? We're not that it's, far. It's right up. Us. It's look straight up. It's like. Wait, there's a clearing right here. Huh. It? Oh, there's a water source. Yeah. There's a water source right there. Perfect. A little pond. So you want to go check those out? Yeah, we'll definitely go in there. Right over a bit. Oh, crap. You okay? That's like crazy deep. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? It's so soft. How you doing there, Eli? Doing, I'm, hey, I'm just hanging out. <laughs> We're just chilling. Well, I don't know, man. 
just gonna stay right here. <laughs> it's a good spot. <laughs> oh god, I just How sinking. far over was it? It wasn't that far, right? It's like just over there, dog. Oh, is it worth it guys? What do you think? Okay. This is oh. oh. I may have broken too soon. Oh god, dude. Holy crap. This is a struggle. This snow is deceptively deep. I made it this far. I'm gonna find these freaking tracks. I think I see them. I think I found them. There it goes off in the snow where I followed it with my drone. It goes off for a while. And then it comes through this grove of trees. And where does it come out? It goes right here. Okay. There's a step. Okay. Oh, jeez. You okay, man? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going through the the like deepest part. I know. I don't have gators or anything. I'm not prepared for this, but luckily we're only like five feet off the yeah. road. Yeah, the road's right there. Yep. So I think we're fine. We're not doing anything terribly stupid, and we've got the truck. And, and we got like all of us. There's enough of us that yeah. could all get stuck no, I'm not, together. No, this is just just trying to find those tracks that were close to the road. And obviously, if we do this again, we'll come back a little more prepared, waterproof gear, muck boots stuff we have in the truck <laughs> that we don't have on. You okay, Eli? Yeah. I think it walked through here. I don't know. I don't see you. These are right nice. came out towards the lake. Yeah? Then they stopped. Huh. Well, how, how big compared to like our tracks? About the same size. Yeah. Could be melt though, I don't know. There's like a, it almost looks like hooves at the bottom. Oh yeah, that would make sense. Could be a moose or, I mean, I don't know, it would probably not a lone caribou. Moose would be heavy enough. That would probably make the most sense to me. Oh boy, this is a workout. Gotta get in and warm up. Gotta get those boots dry. So how'd it go? Went well, I found the tracks. They ended at the lake, or the little pond here. And uh, could have been moose. At some points it looked really like a boot. I, don't, I really don't know. It's hard. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get to see him. I didn't make it out that far. I was kind of saying, I mean, that's sort of, this is a sort of stupid thing we did here. But you know, thankfully we were mere feet from the truck and the road, so it's not that bad. We're all good now. We got the heat cranking, boots drying. We'll be fine, but uh, this is not something you want to play around with otherwise, especially out here, because Alaska will chew you up and spit you out. So what do I think? <laughs> um, Beyond the trail, boys. Well, we didn't go far, but we had quite the adventure. Yeah, um, we really didn't go far. This is, this, is a, this I think this perfectly shows what Alaska is like, where we go out in a place where we think there's a chance we could see something. We sort of spot something that could be out of the ordinary. We go to investigate, and then Alaska just tells us no. No. <laughs> and everything like, in Alaska is harder. Like squashes it's more our, difficult our yeah. expectations of oh we'll just go off the road and there's a little bit of snow, but no we're 
sinking up to our waists in snow. Even 20 and, feet off the trail, it's insanity. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's Alaska. That's Alaska. The moral of the story, don't mess with it. <laughs> We then continued on elsewhere, in search of an area with less snow to traverse. Interesting is when it. I mean, the moose is such a big animal. And that dick, that second one ducks its head down. It's really not given much of a heat register off. I mean, not not much more than any of the trees around it. So it's. I mean, right now even the even the main one that's closer to us, it's down. If it wasn't moving, I would maybe think it's a pile of rocks or something. Yeah, that second one is basically gone from the thermal now. Yep, it's disappeared from the thermal. It's just behind a tree, and now it's emerged again. So, trying to see into the tree line, I mean, unless it's directly in the front, it's, I mean, as good as this thing is, not, not very effective, unfortunately. It's just the capabilities of modern technology. But, given this area is flat, if you were flying the drone over here, I mean, something would be grainy, but you'd be able to see something. So. Hike down this way for a little bit. We cautiously explored the immediate area, knowing full well that large moose were not far away, and there could be potential grizzly bears in the area as well. Dang, there's not much of a lookout here. I was hoping to see more. Oh, look. The road does keep going. Sorry, Andy. View quite something. And then the sticks. These are the sticks. Just enjoying the view. Don't see any moose out here. Holy crap, look at this. Yeah, we're getting a lot of mosquitoes right now. Not a whole lot going on, just wanted to come out and see what we could see. It's got some moose. That's about it. Nothing else wants to show itself tonight. That's alright. Let's get away from these bugs, man. Alright. All in all, it was quite the adventure. 
Mid-May, it seems, was still too snowy of a time to visit much of interior Alaska. Right as we were leaving, it seemed like summer was beginning and the leaves were coming into place. Perhaps that would have allowed us to get into certain areas with more ease. Interior Alaska is just too big to cover in a short time. Seeing it all before you from above just amplifies the feeling of the vast Alaskan expanse. We heard some interesting stories along our travels, and it seems that the idea of a large undiscovered creature like Sasquatch existing doesn't come as a surprise to many Alaskans. While we only saw a sliver of the interior, it will be hard to forget such a place. Later this year, Small Town Monsters will be releasing an On the Trail of Bigfoot film, as well as our Kenai Peninsula Beyond the Trail investigation which I'm excited to share with everybody eventually. As we usually like to say, for now the journey continues, beyond the trail. Mm -hmm.